Have you ever noticed that no matter where you go, there are always some birds around? That's because these animals have conquered literally every part of our planet. From deserts to rainforests to the middle of the ocean, birds have figured out how to survive. With all the crazy adaptations they've had to evolve to make this possible, it may seem hard to believe that the world's most unique and bizarre birds could all live in the same place. But that's because you haven't seen Isabella Island, the largest of the world-famous Galapagos Archipelago. This place is home to a collection of birds so unbelievable that most people think that it could only exist in a zoo. And today, we're going to show you just how crazy one island's birds can be when you let evolution run wild for millions of years in isolation. My name is Harrison, and this is Evan. We're twin brothers on a mission to help you become an insider in the natural world by sharing the incredible stories of our wildlife in a way you've never seen them before. The more you learn about the birds of Isabella, the wilder they get. From relationships that last longer than most people's, to icons that seem totally out of place, but have adapted perfectly to this tropical paradise. These may just be the most unique birds in the entire world, and it's time to show you why. The most important resource for many of the birds in the Galapagos is the cold, food-rich water that surrounds the islands, which is brought by currents that move across the Pacific, especially the Humboldt Current coming up from Antarctica. These currents carry a ton of nutrients, which allows fish and crustaceans and all sorts of other marine creatures to be incredibly abundant, which makes the islands a haven for seabirds, like the first species we want to show you, the waved albatross. Now, the trouble is, these birds are nomadic, so you're really only going to see them off of Isabella way out at sea. So to get reliable shots of them, we had to follow their incredible annual journey across the archipelago to the island of Española, which is the only place in the entire world where these birds breed. We haven't even been here more than five minutes, and we have already got the waved albatross, and there's not just one. There are at least 30 of them here. Now we have one nesting right here, three more over there, and we'll get you some shots of all of them that are covering the rocks by the ocean. This is one of the only places in the world that these birds will nest. They will spend weeks at a time over the ocean searching for prey as they reach adult size. This is absolutely incredible, and honestly, we had no idea it would be this easy to get close to these albatrosses. We're gonna try and get some shots, but how cool is that? For most of the year, albatrosses are solitary birds, spending their time flying out over the open ocean hunting for fish and squid. They can spend weeks or even months at a time out at sea, and they can fly for hours or even up to a day without landing due to the specialized structure of their wings. When they do briefly return to land, they have one of the sweetest and most incredible stories of any bird because they are some of the most loyal partners in the animal kingdom. Albatrosses are monogamous, which means that they will only mate with one bird and those pairs stay together for their entire lives. And given the fact that these albatrosses can live up to 45 years, that means some of these couples will last 40 years or more. Being monogamous has a very important function for them, because raising an albatross chick to adulthood is a huge investment of energy that's actually too much for one single bird to achieve, and they can only lay one egg at a time. This means that finding a partner that can adequately care for the chick is really important, because if either partner fails to do so, there's a good chance that the chick won't survive. Now, these albatrosses are very loyal, and most won't divorce their partner for the rest of their lives. They'll pretty much only split if they have multiple successive breeding failures. It is actually referred to as a divorce, by the yeah. way, sometimes, which I think is amazing. There's actually something really human about the way these birds raise their chicks as a family and rely on one another. And I don't think it's something that a lot of people realize actually happens in the animal kingdom. Absolutely. However, we are just getting started showing you some of the most unique birds that call these islands home, so we're going to go back to Isabella and look at a species that you probably wouldn't expect to see here at all. Scattered throughout this lagoon behind us is a whole flock of American flamingos. These guys are completely unmistakable, and what's even more exciting for us is that these are actually our lifers. Now this lagoon is full of brackish water, which is a mixture of salt and fresh water, which is a perfect habitat for these flamingos because it's a great place for them to feed. Flamingos primarily feed on small crustaceans and other invertebrates, particularly brine shrimp. And many people may know that that's actually where they derive their coloration from. The more shrimp they eat, the richer and more pink their feathers become. 
An arid desert island probably doesn't seem like a very good place to find flamingos, but Isabella has all the makings of perfect flamingo habitat. Now, these birds are iconic, but if you actually stop to look at them, they're kind of bizarre. But their strange proportions actually serve them really well, because flamingos are specialists when it comes to how and where they feed. Their prey is only found in these shallow, salty pools, so their long legs and neck allow them to reach much farther into the water to access those food resources. And they use their large, webbed feet to kick up the sediment and scare out all of the invertebrates that they eat. This is where that crazy looking beak comes into play. Flamingos feed by sticking their heads underwater upside down and using their hooked beak to scoop up small quantities of water. Now the way this works is their beak is lined with tiny plate-like structures called lamellae, which essentially act like a strainer, and it allows the water to pass through and traps little particles of food that the flamingos then eat. Since their heads have to be underwater for this to work, they're able to hold their breath for quite a long time, but they do look pretty funny when they're feeding this way, and getting to see them do it so close to us was one of the highlights of our adventure. The flamingo's pink color is absolutely unmistakable, but it turns out that enhancing your color with the food you eat is actually pretty common in the animal kingdom. And for another of the Galapagos' most famous birds, it actually plays a vital role in their breeding behavior. The blue-footed booby is easily one of the most recognizable birds in the Galapagos, due in no small part to their bright blue feet. This incredible coloration comes from the food they eat, mostly small fish like sardines and anchovies, which are high in pigments called carotenoids. The way this works is pretty simple. The more fish a booby eats, the brighter blue its feet will become. But the opposite is also true, and after just a few days of reduced feeding, their feet start to become duller. So, the brightness of a booby's feet is essentially a reliable and honest signal of that booby's overall health and ability to find food, which are very important considerations when choosing a mate. Like the albatrosses, raising a booby chick is a huge investment of time and energy. So boobies are very particular about choosing mates that will be able to provide for their young successfully. Both male and female boobies will evaluate the health of their partner by looking at the color of their feet, and their courtship ritual is this really elaborate dance that involves the boobies raising up their feet and showing them to each other, which is absolutely adorable. What's more, even after mating, the boobies will continue to inspect the health of their partner and adjust their effort levels accordingly. Females will invest more resources into laying eggs for males with brighter colored feet, and the males will invest more energy and paternal care into females that lay larger eggs and look healthier themselves. This unique strategy makes it much more likely for healthy boobies to find each other and mate successfully. So even though it's a little weird to us, it's actually made them one of the most successful birds in the entire archipelago. The boobies are adorably weird, but they are far from the most bizarre birds in the Galapagos. And the next one on our list is an island giant that you've probably never heard of before. The flightless cormoran, which very few people ever get to see up close. It's really exciting to be able to see so many cormorants on this beach. There are eight of them sitting right behind me. And this is particularly notable because this is an endangered species. Now you can see they have pretty adorable bodies with those tiny, almost vestigial wings. It really makes their bodies look extra large. And that stands to reason because this is the largest species of cormorant in the entire world. Their proportions are kind of goofy looking, but I think they're absolutely beautiful. Now, I grant that beautiful is probably not the word most people will use to describe these cormorants, especially because they sound like this. What's amazing about these birds, though, is that their kind of freaky appearance is actually perfectly suited for the lives they lead, which is only made possible by the unique conditions of the Galapagos. Cormorants are piscivorous, or fish-eating birds, and while the oceans that surround the islands are full of fish, the land pretty much offers no prey for them at all. But there are also no predators for them on land, so despite the fact that they're kind of slow and inefficient, they really have nothing to worry about once they come up onto the beach. However, they do rely on the ocean to find their food. All cormorants hunt underwater, but the other species also have to fly to be able to avoid predators and to migrate to faraway breeding grounds every year. Without those added pressures, the flightless cormorant's evolution was shaped primarily by their need for food, which over millions of years took away their ability to fly in exchange for being incredibly powerful and efficient aquatic hunters. 
The large bulky wings that would allow these over 10 pound birds to be able to fly would actually be a hindrance underwater, as they capture a lot of air and would be very hard to submerge. The smaller, sparser wings that the cormorants have evolved are about a third of the size that they would need to be to fly, but they allow them to sort of fly underwater with incredible speed and maneuverability. They are perfectly suited for life in the ocean, but as you watch them on land, they're very awkward and, in a way, kind of cute. I would have to agree. But there's another icon of the bird world that shares a very similar story to the cormorants that totally steals the show. And the fact that they're here at all is a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. The Galapagos Penguin. We finally made it to the area where the penguins are hanging out, and this is absolutely blowing my mind. There are five of them sitting on the rock behind us, and a couple more swimming in this cove. These are Galapagos penguins, the only tropical penguins in the world, and the only penguins found north of the equator. It's really strange to even see them. It absolutely is. We have found some of the most incredible birds in the Galapagos, but nothing tops seeing penguins in the wild for the very first time. Unfortunately, nearly 77% of the penguins here in the Galapagos were lost in the past, so the fact that we're able to see them here right now is really important. Not only are penguins probably the most unlikely birds to be living in the Galapagos, they're also the weirdest penguins in the world relative to the rest of their family. Even though they live in the tropics, these are still cold weather birds, so they've had to adapt significantly to the very warm conditions in the Galapagos, which sit around 28 degrees Celsius, around 82 Fahrenheit, all year round. This is the second smallest species of penguin in the entire world, topping out at around 50 centimeters tall and four kilograms in weight. And this small body size allows them to dissipate heat much more easily than they could if their bodies were larger. They also have a number of behaviors that help keep them cool. They'll swim in the freezing cold waters that surround the islands, hunch their bodies over their feet to prevent the sun from heating their exposed blood vessels too much, and even yawn or pant to help heat escape their head and cool their brain. Now, the question is, if life is so hard for them here, why do they stay? The answer is twofold. One, they have an abundance of prey here to rely on, and two, they really don't have a choice. In good years, the waters of the Galapagos are full of fish and marine invertebrates supported by the Humboldt Current, everything the penguins need to survive. However, the flip side of that is that penguins can't really venture much farther than a few kilometers away from their nesting beaches, so they rely on the currents to bring them the food and cold water that they need to survive. And that doesn't always happen. Every few years, there's a climatic shift in the Pacific Ocean called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which rapidly warms the surface of the ocean as the cold currents are diverted away from the region temporarily. This spells disaster for much of the wildlife in the Galapagos, as it drastically reduces their food sources and wreaks havoc on the aquatic ecosystems that these penguins depend on. This is the same phenomenon that wiped out nearly 80% of Galapagos penguins in previous years. And when we were visiting the islands, we were right at the start of one of the worst El Nino events on record. The Galapagos penguin is a highly endangered species with less than 1,500 birds remaining. So it's very important that we continue to monitor their populations to understand how they're faring in the wake of these massive changes. El Nino events are made even worse by the effects of the global climate change that humans are causing. So even though these penguins live in almost complete isolation from human interactions, save for the occasional intrepid wildlife filmmaker, they are still heavily affected by our activities. And what we do anywhere in the world can have a profound impact on their survival. And for that matter, that of all the species we showed you today. The Galapagos probably seem about as distant and exotic as a place can be, but the many challenges facing the wildlife here prove that they are far from free of our influence. Isabella Island is truly unlike anywhere else on Earth, and if we don't protect it here and now, we will lose the extraordinary biodiversity that makes this place so special. It's a real privilege to share the planet with such unique and irreplaceable birds, but it's not one we'll have forever if we don't continue to learn about these animals, share their incredible stories, and do as much as we can to mitigate the effects of the climate crisis. To that end, we have full videos on all of these birds coming soon, so if you want to dive deeper into their fascinating lives, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss those episodes when they're released.
Until then though, if you want to see some more mind-blowing birds that may be much closer to home, check out this video where we catch up with some of the most extreme sea ducks back in the United States. And with that, we hope you enjoyed and we'll see you in the next one.